I'm going to start by uh, kind of unusually, I'll, I'll read a, an epic poem that I just spent the last hour composing. <laughs> I was tempted to sing it, but then I realized, no, I'm, I'm way too nervous. You might recognize what the tune should be, though. So just sit right back, and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip, of three brilliant castaways aboard a tiny ship. One got the physics Nobel Prize, another chemistry. The third was an economist, all with PhDs. Well, of course, they wrecked the ship, wrecked it to smithereens, and all they had with them to eat was a can of beans. The physicist said clearly, to open up this can, we'll build a lever catapult out of sticks and sand. The chemist said, no siree, that can would just get crushed. Once it hit that cliff face, the beans would be mush. So instead, he said, let's use Boyle's law. Fire for heat and pressure, too. This plan has no flaw. The economist said, actually, that can would explode. Beans and shrapnel everywhere? To that, I say no. So let's do what we always do in my esteemed field. <laughs> let's assume we have a can opener. So what, what was the point of this? Okay. Uh, if you've been around economics for a while, you probably recognize the joke. Right? And if you know like, old TV shows, you might recognize it's Gilligan's Island that I've rewritten. Okay, anyway, so what is the point of this? Right? So the idea is that as mainstream economists, we'll often just assume right, can openers to make difficult problems easier. Right? And my claim is going to be that when you look at monetary reform proposals, you're often going to find that they rest on these can opener types of assumptions, assumptions that are blatantly false, but that make it easier to decide what monetary policy should do, but in the end could potentially create more dangerous consequences or at the very least not be particularly useful. On the other hand, if we adopt something like a market-based money, like generally the faculty here would um, support, and certainly I would support, it might be the, the, money, the market-based money isn't perfect, right, by some arbitrary utopian standard, uh, but I suggest it's better than perfect. It's good enough. Right? That is, it will actually do what we want money to do. All right, so uh, before we start talking about monetary policy reform, we need to think about why would we bother reforming the thing? What are the problems that we'd like to solve? And I would suggest there are two major problems that could potentially be solved right, with the right set of monetary policy reforms, that is, reforms in the money and banking systems. Right? Uh, the first problem is that of hyperinflation. We know this is a rare problem, but an extremely severe one in the cases where it happens. Right? I would certainly encourage you to talk to those that are visiting from Venezuela about just how crazy right, things can be when you face that particular problem. Uh, the second, much more common problem, would be business cycles, which I think uh, Dr. Garrison does a marvelous job, right, showing how business cycles in the Austrian perspective are caused by this uh, discoordination, right, from the monetary system coming in through credit markets, right? So if we could ameliorate or, uh, or even solve, would be great, right, these two problems, that would be certainly beneficial to us. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start by just say, stating the Misesian view when you read Mises, what he says right, monetary policy should look like. He says sound money really contains two aspects. Right? Uh, first, a positive affirmation of the market's choice of money, but then on the negative side, right, trying to put obstructions in the way right, of government's tendency right, to meddle right, in currency. So before we get into the Austrian proposals, though, I want to go through a few mainstream proposals. Right? Uh, so when we look at mainstream proposals for monetary policy reform, you get into really the big debate is discretion right, versus rules. Right? So should we have a system where we have some group of experts, we might call them the FOMC in, say, the American system, they get together and they use their collective wisdom to decide what monetary policy should look like, right? or should we have a more restrictive system right, where it is simply by rule, right? It's much more predictable based on whatever it happens to be, okay? All right, so we'll go into a few specific rules here in a minute. Uh, before we get into the specifics, though, I do want to just mention a few kind of general problems uh, with various rules, actually any of these rules, I'd suggest you would run into this set of basically three problems. Uh, the first problem would be political power and its connection, right, with these rules. Right. Right, so the question is, can we have a system where we can create the rule, right, but then not have it be messed with later? Right? Right, so how would the rule get created? There are two possible ways that I can think of. Right? One would be that the Federal Reserve right, continues to exist as an institution, but voluntarily right, adopts some kind of rule. Right? So the FOMC gets together and says, you know, we think that John Taylor's a smart guy. Right? We're going to start using the Taylor rule, which I'll describe here in a little bit. 
So we're just going to follow that. Which then you start wondering why we're paying their salaries if, if a calculator can do their job for them. Right? But I'm sure they're happy to collect them and following a reasonable rule. Uh, that sounds fine. But the question then is what keeps them from changing their mind later? Right? If the rule tells them to do something that maybe they don't want to do for whatever reason, right, they can just as easily abandon the rule and do something else. Now, okay, let's back away from the Federal Reserve. Suppose that we get uh, a more radical result, that we have Congress say we don't like the idea of this discretionary authority, that we don't have a whole lot of control over, right, just deciding what to do with monetary policy. So we're going to abolish the Federal Reserve, and everybody cheers, right? And we're going to replace it right, with a monetary policy rule, right? Okay. But what is it that's then going to prevent Congress from stepping in later, right, and messing with this rule? Okay, now, now, I'm not saying that it's never the case, right, that Congress can create an institution that it then finds very difficult to mess with. I think of our social security system, for example. Right? They, they created it, and now it's remarkably difficult right, to make any changes since the system itself right, creates this class of people right, that benefit from it existing in its current form. Uh, it's not so obvious that that would be the case with a, any kind of monetary policy rule. Most people don't understand monetary policy at all, so getting them excited and worried about changes in monetary policy is... Difficult, we'll just say that. Okay, all right, so there's the political power problem. A second problem is the problem of measurement error. Right? Uh, the reality is that all this economic data that underlies and is pulled from right, in order to enact these rules, right, there's some error involved, right? And that's generally the case. If you've taken uh, basically any classes in, say, principles of macroeconomics, right, you talk about measuring GDP, right, something like that, a very standard measure. Right, one of the things you should typically learn, I hope, right, is that we measure three, um, GDP at least three times. Right? There's the preliminary measure that gets released, right? It's released first, that's what preliminary means. Right? And then there's kind of the, the official release that comes out after that. And then there's the revision that comes later. Right? So this suggests that we understand right, that we don't measure it right the first time. As additional data comes in, we make revisions right, to try to be more correct. Now, the problem is that when we're making monetary policy, we, we have to do it moment by moment, right? relying on the data we have. Right? If that data is erroneous, right, then we're going to be making errors in policy. Right? Like, even following the rule itself, we're not going to be doing right, right because the data is wrong right, that is uh, underlying it. Right? Uh, a third problem that generally I would say these rules um, face is that they have an underlying assumption of some kind of staticness right, in the way the economy works. This, say there's some stable relationships out in the economy that we can rely on so that the monetary policy rule, rule will work the way we hope it will. Okay, so kind of with all three of those in mind as applying in basically all of these cases, uh, let's then look at some specifics. All right, so the first rule, let's see where I put this stuff. Ah, there it is. Right, which I introduced not so much because it's very popular nowadays, but because kind of historically, it's probably the first that became particularly popular. There we go. Uh, would be the Friedman rule, right? So, uh, so this comes from Milton Friedman, right, a name that we're probably familiar with, right? right? And what Friedman suggested right, was that we should have monetary policy simply just increase the money supply right, at a constant rate each year, right? generally assuming something between 3 and 5%, right? Some, something in that range. We'll, we'll pick one of these percentages and go with it. Okay. All right, so kind of to get to the logic underlying that, uh, it's really all based here on the equation of exchange, also sometimes called the quantity equation. Right, so these are two different ways of measuring spending in the economy. Right. Right, on the left-hand side, we think of it in the monetary fashion. Right, so M would just be the money supply. Uh, v is the velocity of money. It's, it's a measure of how many times an average dollar right, is spent in the economy each year. Right, so if, for example, people hold on to money for very, very long periods of time without spending it, then velocity is very low. Right? On the other hand, if as soon as you hand me a dollar, I go out and I spend it right away, then velocity will be very high. Right? The same dollar gets spent multiple times. Right, so one way we can look at it is this way. Take the amount of money out there, multiply by the number of times each dollar is spent in a year. That's how much spending we have. Uh, the other way of thinking of it is in terms of PT, right? P being kind of a general uh, level of prices, T being the number of transactions. Right, so there are a number of transactions that happen in the economy. Each of these transactions has some price attached to it. Right, right, so multiply those prices times the transactions. That's how much spending happened. Right, so either one of these right, uh, are going to measure spending. Right? And what Friedman suggests right, is that over time, right, velocity doesn't really change much. Right, that it's basically constant. Right, so you could consider that constant. Meanwhile, transactions, or we could think of real GDP as being very similar here, 
uh, tends to increase something in the neighborhood of 3-4% a year. Right? Right, so if we want to have fairly stable prices, right, we should have then money grow at basically 3 or 4% a year. Right? And that would make everything balance out. Okay. All right. Now, uh, he didn't pretend that that would mean every single year prices would be stable. Right? He understood right, the average growth in the economy is not the growth every single year. Uh, but one, I guess, insight that Friedman had, one of the things that I kind of appreciate, that, appreciate about him, actually, uh, is that he understood right, that the monetary policy doesn't work right away. Right? It, it takes time right, for monetary policy to work, right? uh, which means right, when you're starting that downturn, right, it's already too late to start stimulating the economy. Right? Right? You should have been doing it before right, for the monetary policy to have the effect. Right? So he said, let's not try to fine tune this. Right? Let's just get things right on average. Right? And the economy will generally self-correct for the details. Okay. Right, so this sounds kind of nice. And in some of his writings, he even suggested right, that we could abolish the Federal Reserve and replace it with a calculator right, to do this job. Right? So, so we could save some salaries that way as well. Right, so, okay, this doesn't immediately sound too bad. But what is it really kind of, what's the underlying assumption? Right? How does this compare to what I would think of as a more ideal system? Now, I would suggest we want money to act basically like any other good in the economy. That is, if people demand more of it, we produce more of it. Right? Right. So underlying this then would be the assumption right, that people just want 3 or 4 or 5% more money every single year. Right? Right? And we're just mechanically right, producing that much. Now imagine if somebody proposed this with some other good. Right? Right? Say, you know, I, I'm tired of this chaotic shoe production we have in the US. Right? Let's just adopt right, a shoe production rule Right? where every year we increase the quantity of shoes we produce by 3% a year. Right? And then we can make some equation if we want. So, oh, see, population increases basically at 2 or 3% a year, plus people might want more shoes. Right? And so on average, right, 3 or 4% uh, per year for shoe production would work. Now, now this might not be a, a totally stupid way if, say, you're, you're planning shoe production yourself. Right? Right? But to adopt this as a policy over the long term, we would expect we would have some serious errors take place. Right? Anyway, right, so I would su suggest that we have the same thing here. Right? Mechanically having the money supply increase according to some predetermined rule is not going to allow the money supply to respond right, to money demand. I might be able to think of other applications where there are other types of um, proposed monies that operate along similar lines, where you have a very strict, fixed right, uh, path that the, the supply of that particular money is going to follow over time that doesn't really respond right, to the demand for that money. I'll let you make that extension. Okay. All right. Well, there's another um, problem with this, though, uh, that was recognized by Alan Greenspan when he was chair of the Fed. Right. Uh, as you may or may not know, the chair of the Fed has to right, sit before Congress a couple times a year right, to report on monetary policy and answer questions and that kind of thing. Well, it, it came one of these years, right, he was you know, sitting there in Congress and answering questions, and one of the um, Congress people asked, said, well, why don't we follow a monetary policy rule? Right. And the, the way the story goes is that um, Alan Greenspan said, well, we just don't know what money is anymore. If you, if you want to instill confidence, I, I would not suggest that the head of the um, organization that does monetary policy should say we don't know what money is. But when you start looking at the data that he was looking at, we can understand what he meant. Right there. Right? So this is naturally somewhat stylized, but we know that we generally have two major uh, forms of money that we think about measuring in the mainstream. Right? One would be M1, which is a narrower that measure of money. The other would be M2, which is a bit broader. Right? M1 generally would include things like uh, you know, currency that you're carrying in your pocket or what have you, or you have in your mattress, right? uh, along with checking accounts and other ch types of checkable deposits. Uh, meanwhile, M2 would add into that things like uh, small certificates of deposit, savings accounts, and the like. Right? Right, so M2 is significantly larger than M1, so I was just trying to show here what the changes were looking like around that time. Right, so if you look in the late 90s, we had this strange thing where M1 basically flattened. Right, you look at M1 in 2000, it's almost exactly the same as it was in 95. Uh, meanwhile, M2 was going up fairly quickly. Right? Right, so then there's a very practical question. Even if we believe that increasing the money supply at a constant rate is what we should do, well, which money supply? Right? Are we talking about M1? Are we talking about M2? Or maybe the monetary base or something else? Right? How should we measure money right, is a question that then gets bound up right, in this question of if we're going to increase the money supply at a constant rate, what should we do at any particular moment? Okay. 
And so we don't know what money is anymore. M1 and M2 are not acting the same. Right? We don't know what to do on the basis of this rule. Okay, so that's the Friedman rule. Uh, a second rule, which uh, is much more popular nowadays, right, is the Taylor rule, which I've mentioned before. There we go. Hey, that's almost legible. That's great. Okay, so uh, the Taylor rule, I was originally designed actually uh, based on kind of trying to model what the Federal Reserve actually did, but then John Taylor, who created this rule, did some theoretical work and said, oh no, this is actually a good rule. It's, it's not just that this is what the Fed has done historically, so we should stick this in our models, uh, but this is, actually makes sense, right, in some sense. Okay, all right, so here's what it is. Right? So he realized that the way that the Federal Reserve functions today is that we're, we're not really worried about the money supply directly. Right? We're interested in this federal funds rate, FFR. Right? That's what he suggested we should do then to determine what that target federal funds rate should be is follow this equation. Right? So the first thing we need to do is think about what the long-term real interest rate should be. So the, the interest rate after adjusting for inflation, what should that be? So we start with that. Right? Then we add to that the rate of inflation that we observe in the economy. Right? Right? And then we, so that would get us to a nominal interest rate, which the federal funds rate is. Right? And then we add right, two additional components to this based on what the economy is doing at the moment. Right? So each of these are weighted with 0.5. Right? So there's the inflation gap. So how much difference there is right, between the actual inflation we're observing, here he's talking about price inflation, right, versus what we, what we want inflation to be, right, so say 2%, right, right, so if, say, we observed over the past year 3% price inflation, right, where we want it to be 2%, this would suggest we take that gap, that's 1, multiply it by 0.5, so we add another half percentage point, right, to the interest rate, what our target should be. Right. And then we also have this element for the output gap, that is how much difference there is right, between GDP as we measure it and what we believe the trend GDP to be. Right. So if, for example, we have a boom in the economy, so we believe we're, say, three percentage points above what trend GDP would be, multiply that, that by 0.5, three times 0.5 is 1.5. I can do arithmetic if I try. Right. So we add another one and a half percentage points right, then to our federal funds rate. Right. Now, when we start using this, you can see where it would kind of act the way we normally, if you take a macroeconomics class, the way we generally think that the Federal Reserve acts, right? Inflation goes up, interest rates go up in response, right? Inflation drops, interest rates fall in response, right? Uh, we have a boom, right? That is the output gap grows in the positive direction. We raise interest rates in response, right? Output collapses, we have a recession interest rates fall in response, right? So this is all what we'd expect. So it's not surprising that he found something like this. I was actually surprised mostly that, we, that when he did the historical work, 0.5 and 0.5 actually came out to be basically what the Fed has done historically, though with some exceptions. Okay. All right, so I would say as rules go, right, if we're stuck with this kind of idea, you know, I'm maybe just too nice, I've got, not gotten old enough yet or something, I don't know, right? But this doesn't feel like a totally terrible rule, uh, mostly because I believe that if we had a market-based um, system, uh, we would generally see interest rates kind of act the way this rule tells us. Right? That is, if inflation goes up, I generally would expect we would see higher interest rates. Right? So making them do that feels like a fairly natural response in terms of the direction. Right? Similarly, it's believable to me that if the economy is doing really well, we might see interest rates rise in response to that. Uh, now, here we can... Now, I would not work this through this mechanistic way, but thinking about time preference, right? So the economy's doing really well, I feel really optimistic, I think the economy is going to be even better in the future, right? So if I think I'm going to be really, really wealthy in the future, I'm not that hesitant to spend now, right? As I become more present-oriented right, and increase in my rate of time preference, interest rates will follow and also rise, right? So in as far as right, a boom in the economy leads to this kind of um, confidence in the future, right, and therefore a willingness to spend now, this feels like it is actually moving us the right direction. Uh, however, the problem is that if we, when we look at things like interest rates, we need not just the direction to be right, but the magnitude to be right too. Right? Uh, and there's no reason to believe at all right, that a one percentage point in the output gap, that an appropriate you know, market level or market based change in the interest rate would be 0.5. Right? Where did this come from? And even if it is 0.5 today, there's no reason to believe it'll be 0.5 tomorrow. Right? People can respond differently over time right, to these changes in their level of income or what have you. Right? So even if we're moving the right direction, we don't have the magnitude right. 
Now, there are also another couple criticisms about this that even those that would like to use this rule would also acknowledge. Uh, one being that very first term, right? What should the real interest rate be in the long term? Right? I don't know either, right? And it turns out even the professional economists that use this acknowledge that we don't actually have a good way of knowing that, right? So underlying this is this estimate. Similarly, inside that output gap is trend GDP. Well, like we can, we can extract a statistical trend, right? But that doesn't necessarily tell us that that's what GDP would be at full employment or however you want to define this more precisely, right? right so there is a certain amount of estimation in here, which naturally then would also include error. Okay. Now, I, now there is some evidence though that we should pay a lot of attention to this rule. Uh, just very recently, I think it was two or three days ago, uh, Jerome Powell was talking to Congress. Right? And as part of his comments, uh, I brought it up here on the Federal Reserve website, they've posted what his comments to uh, the um, Congress were. Toward the very end, he says, for guideposts on appropriate policy, the FOMC routinely looks at monetary policy rules Oh, okay. that recommend a level for the federal funds rate uh -huh, based on the current rates of inflation, there we are, and unemployment. Unemployment being very closely connected right, with the output gap. Uh, and if you, if you go in and look at, they also provide a written report that you can look at on their website. They have basically five different, slightly different versions of things that look like the Taylor rule that are certainly inspired by what Taylor did. So if you do want to understand how central bankers in the US right now think about monetary policy, uh, the Taylor rule is very significant. Okay. Yet somehow they're not really considering him very seriously, it seems to be on the FOMC, eh, whatever. All right. uh, another option, uh, which, is, which has gained some traction in some places, in, is inflation targeting. So the idea behind inflation targeting is that you have really a discretionary authority, uh, but they declare a specific inflation target that they're going to try to hit. Uh, the country that made this rather well known was New Zealand. Uh, they had relatively high rates of inflation for some period of time, uh, but they decided they wanted to get this under control. Right? So they declared, right, we're, we're just going to have 5% inflation in a couple of years. We're going to do what it takes to get there. And, and they found, sure enough, they actually got really close, right? right? Their inflation rate came down really, really fast, right? And without a whole lot of economic disruption, right? Which was kind of surprising, right? So there was a lot of popularity from that. You've also seen other countries, uh, the UK adopted something very much like this as well, as they were facing five, six percent, right? levels of price inflation, they brought it down around 2%. You can also see elements of that in the Federal Reserve statements nowadays. See, you know, they're very clear, right? we're targeting 2% inflation. Right? You never saw that kind of clarity right, from somebody like Alan Greenspan, who seemed to have gone out of his way to be unclear as much as possible. Right? Right, so we have inflation targeting as another option. Right? So what's the problem with that? Well, here I would suggest that measurement problems become extremely important. Right? Right. How do we measure inflation? Oh, CPI. Right. Well, yes, but what about you know, the PCE? What about the GDP deflator and so on? Right? We have a number of different measures. Right? So we're kind of back in a similar boat here. Right? Right, so if we're trying to target inflation, we don't always see right, all of these different measures move in lockstep. Right? Sometimes they move different directions. So we could imagine at some point, right, somebody appearing before Congress as the head of the Federal Reserve saying, well, but we just don't know what prices are anymore. Which may be more disturbing than not knowing what money is. <laughs> we just don't know what prices are, okay. All right, so that, that is a potential problem here with this system. Okay. And I'm not claiming that I'm putting out all problems if you think, but what about this problem too? You're probably right, <laughs> there are other problems as well. Okay, the last one I wanna mention uh, would be uh, NGDP or nominal GDP targeting. Uh, this one, uh, Scott Sumner is the one who's most associated with this idea, but there are also some people who uh, are associated with the Austrians uh, that would consider this to be a reasonable uh, solution. Uh, specifically, Horwitz and Luther have taken this position, calling this a second best right, solution to monetary policy. It's maybe not their preferred plan, but it's something that is reasonable. All right, so the idea behind Scott Sumner's uh, rule here is we have nominal GDP, uh, which we can measure as price level multiplied by the number of transactions. Does this feel familiar? Yeah, okay. All right, so the idea is we want to stabilize this, right? perhaps have it you know, stable or perhaps have it you know, increasing at a fairly low rate, at three or four percent a year, that kind of thing. We'd have some specific target for this. Right? Now, if we think about this, right, kind of turning it around to that MV sort of notation, right, I would say this, I can understand right, why Austrians are getting behind this idea. 
right? Right, so if we think in terms of MV, right? right? So if we want to stabilize NGDP and say velocity falls, right? What do we have to do to make things equalize? Right? We have to increase the M, right? Okay, so money supply has to go up when velocity falls. So what does it mean when velocity falls? Well, well people are spending money more slowly, right? So put another way, I'm holding money for longer periods of time, right? Okay, so what does an increase in the demand for money look like? Well, I think part of that would be that I'm holding money for longer periods of time. Now, part of it is that I'm trying to sell stuff and work more and that kind of thing. But once I get money, I hold on to it for a while. Right? So I, I think it's not unreasonable right, to say that as V drops, that, that is a sign right, that the demand for money has increased. Right? In response to that, what happens with the NGDP rule? We increase the money supply. We found it, right? This is, this is nice, okay. On the other hand, if money supply, if, um, not money supply, if money demand drops, right? Velocity increases, I'm spending money fast because I don't really want to hold on to it, right? Velocity goes up, well, we have to drop M, okay? Right? People don't want the money, we end up removing money from, this, from the system under this sort of setup. Now, so this, this feels pretty good. It's getting things moving in the right direction again. We're increasing money supply in response to right, money demand. That's really good, right? Or doing the opposite as necessary. And so what is this missing? Now, I would suggest this, this misses if we're assuming the current structure of how money enters the economy, right? We're missing all of these distortionary, distortionary effects through the credit market, right? So we're increasing the money supply. How do we increase the money supply under our current system, right? Well, the Fed creates the money, puts it into the banking system, right? right? So we still have business cycle effects happening here, right? Even if things are moving the right direction, because of the way that money enters at that single point, right, we still have problems in terms of the business cycle. Right? Now, I'd suggest that if, say, we're doing something like mining gold, we don't have the same problem. Just think of how money under a gold mining system enters the economy, right? Okay, so who does the money go to first? That's the people that are mining the gold, right, physically doing the labor, also the people owning the gold mines, right? Well, where did they spend their money? I would guess that gold miners and people that own gold mines aren't that weird, right? They're kind of normal people, right? So they're going to spend the money basically the way anybody else would, right? So we don't see this big concentration like we do in credit markets, right, when we increase money supply as we do under our current system, right? So this may not be terrible, right, if we're going to take as given that money has to come through credit markets, but it, it is still inferior, right, to the good enough system of having something like gold or some other commodity. Okay, now let's move then for the last you know, 15 minutes or so, looking at some Austrian proposals. Okay, so I've broken these down into two broad categories. First, looking at currency and then looking at banking. Okay, so under currency, there are really two uh, main proposals that I've seen. Right, one is to revive the gold dollar. Right, both Mises and Rothbard had plans right, for how we might do this. Right, so we know that we're under a fiat system right now. How do we move from this fiat money right, to a more gold-based currency? Well, they have slightly different plans, but they're, they're kind of similar. Uh, Mises suggests right, that in the first step, what we need to do is stop issuing paper dollars. Right? So, so no more paper dollars going to be issued. Those that are out there still circulate. That's fine. Right? And we also, as we're going through this process, the Fed and the Treasury are not allowed to just start selling gold. Right? They, they hold the gold they have for a while. Right? And we watch. When the price of gold stabilizes under the system, we then establish a parity between the two and we say, okay, so if you bring in this many dollars, we'll give you an ounce of gold, right, based on what the price was the previous day, say, that's going to be the ratio between the two, or we can do vice versa, right, bring us an ounce of gold and you get the paper dollars in exchange. Okay, so effectively what we're doing is taking the dollar, right, turning it into a money certificate backed by gold, right, and you can exchange between the two, say at any bank or the Federal Reserve or what have you. He suggests setting up a conversion agency, so it's a sub separate institution to do this. It doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. Right? Uh, as another part of this, he, he said in order to prevent the government from then just messing with the system, say changing this ratio arbitrarily, people need to get used to using the monetary commodity, right, on a regular basis, right? So we would need to have not just us using paper like we're already doing, but also us introducing alongside that, right, using the actual coins, right? Say made out of gold, right? He suggested we should eliminate all large bills, which he called $5 and up, right? Which, you know, he was writing in a specific time when $5 meant something different than it does now, uh, but replace these with gold coins, right? It's $5 and up, we can make a gold coin, right? So I, I was doing some math, right, based on recent prices of gold. So assuming that gold prices stabilize basically where they are now, kind of how much would these things be worth? Right, so I have right here in my hand, right, that's an American dime. 
Uh, an American dime weighs something a little bit less than two and a half grams. It's about 2.3 grams. It's a little bit less than a tenth of an ounce. If you know your Latin, you can probably understand why a dime would be about a tenth of something. Right? Right, so a dime, a little bit less than a tenth of an ounce. I think it's like 0 0.08 or 0 0.09, right? something in that neighborhood. Right, so it turns out right now, this little thing, if it were made out of gold, would be worth $120. So might not, might not want to use gold as the coins that we're carrying around, but on the other hand, if we made this thing out of silver, pure silver, right, that would be about $1.50. Okay, right, so we could actually use silver coins right, and replace everything $5 and up, say, uh, with the appropriately sized right, silver or perhaps gold coins for relatively large currencies. Because that seems possible. Okay. Uh, Rothbard had a slightly different approach, uh, something that uh, wouldn't take nearly as much time to implement, I suggest because we're not gonna have to wait for the price of gold to stabilize under his system. He doesn't particularly care if it's stable, it turns out. Right? So he says, this is simple, right? We know that the Fed has a bunch of gold holdings. Right? They're continuing to report them on their asset statements, assuming they're not lying about this. Right? They have a bunch of gold holdings. Right? We know what the money supply is under various measures. Right? Pick one of these measures, right? say here's the redemption ratio, take the money supply, say as measured by M1 or M2, divide by the amount of gold there in the vault, that's the conversion ratio. Then if everybody says, oh, I really want the gold and hands in their dollars, that's fine. Right? We have the gold there. It'll take some time to deliver it, but we can get it to you. It's not a problem. Right? Right? So we don't have to wait for the, st the stability of the price of gold. Okay, so I was doing some math there um, based on kind of different measures. Uh, if we were using, say, M2, I, I like M2 as the, uh, among the government measures. It's, it's not too bad. Uh, it turns out the ratio uh, between our $14 trillion of M2 and the 261 million ounces of government and Federal Reserve held gold, that ratio comes to $54,000 an ounce. That's significantly above the current price of gold. Okay. Right, so, so we would have to acknowledge or this would this would change things right, in terms of the value of a particular ounce of gold, but at the same time, you'd expect that. If gold adopts a more um, monetary use, it, it is actually more valuable right, uh, than if we're just using it to make rings or what have you. Okay. Right, so it would, it would change things, certainly. Uh, on the other hand, if we used a more narrow measure, say I looked at some of the Austrian money supply measures, if we used something like the true money supply one being the narrower, it would be something like $14,000 an ounce, right? so a little bit roughly 10 times right, what the current price of gold is. So we are talking about a significant increase right, in the value of gold if we adopt that system. Okay. Uh, another system, which is actually the one that I would prefer because I'm not much of a radical. <laughs> I'm not, I'm just ashamed to admit it in front of this crowd, though you're generally proud of it. Anyway, it is a system of currency competition. Right? And I suggest this is also one that might be easier to get through politically. Uh, I believe we have someone in the audience who is, in fact, working toward this. Feel free to talk to him afterward. Right, so the idea of currency competition was proposed by Hayek with denationalization of money, and also um, Hans Senholtz, who I have connections with through Grove City College, in his book Money and Freedom. Uh, money and Freedom, uh, Senholtz lays out kind of a list of things that we need to do in order to create currency competition. I believe, if I recall correctly, his list had eight points. Of those, we're already halfway there. Right? Four of his points have already been uh, established uh, by changes in our law. So the fourth end that would remain would be first, right? just allow people to use whatever currency they like in contracts. Right? So, so if I want to use US dollars, we can continue to use US dollars. Right? If I want to use euros, let us use euros, that's fine. If we want to use, uh, say, ounces of gold, that's fine. If we want to use... Um, I don't know, Rothbard Memorial coins made of silver, we can do that as well, right? Well, whatever you want to write the contract in, and that's fine, right? Let people agree to it, okay? Uh, second would be free entry in currency, right? So allow anyone who wants to create their own currency to do so, right? Okay. Third, eliminating legal tender, right? So at, at this point, while it's true, like you and I could write a contract where I agree to give you Rothbard commemorative coins in exchange for your car, right? If it comes down to it and I want to hand you US dollars, right, you are legally required to accept those right, as long as it's a debt contract in any way. Right? So if there's this delay in payment, you have to accept. That's what legal tender means. Right? So, so eliminating legal tender is actually not that radical. Right? Like in spot transactions, I can already say, no, I'd rather not take dollars. Right? It's only in these debt contracts that this really applies. And so it feels really radical to most people to explain how narrow legal tender really is. Okay. Uh, and the fourth thing is honest minting by weight, not by nominal value. Right? So if you buy coins that are issued by the treasury, say a silver dollar, right, or one ounce right, of silver, it has one dollar on it. 
right? which means it's legal tender value, so if I go and try to spend it, it's worth a dollar. Of course, the silver in it is worth something like $15, $16. Add the mint value to it, it's closer to $20, $25. Right? So there's, there's no way that I'd want to actually circulate this thing. I might buy it as an asset to hold because I think silver's going to gain value or something like that, but it won't be used in a monetary way. Right? So all we'd have to do, this is remarkably simple. Right? Just put the weight of the coin on there, leave off a dollar value. Right? Right? So, so here is one ounce of silver, 0.999 pure. We already print that stuff on it, right? Just leave off that one dollar, or just leave off that twenty dollar on the gold coin, which drastically undervalues right, the the value of the gold that's inside of it. That's really all it would take, right? And that would then make right, all of these coins that already exist, right, and that for all we care under this system, let the treasury keep minting these things. Sure, why not, right? And then people could begin to use them alongside right, the other currencies that exist without them being at a disadvantage. Okay, turning then in the last few minutes to banking. Uh, Okay, yes, I'm going to abbreviate this quite a bit because I know that you've gotten a full lecture about Selgin and White uh, from Robert Murphy. Right, so I guess I'll, I'll say there, uh, so frac fractional reserve free banking, we don't like it. I don't like it either. I'm sure Murphy gave you good reasons why not. <laughs> Although I would encourage you, right, if he didn't mention this, right, so if he did not mention this, you need to hear this. Right, right, so you look up the paper, how would the invisible hand handle money? It's available on JSTOR. I I think, I think the Mises Institute has a, a JSTOR account, so if you're signed in through their Wi-Fi, you should probably be able to get to, get to it. There's a math error in it, right? right? So look between, I believe it is, equations six prime and seven, right? See if you can spot the math error, right? You don't need calculus, you need like eighth grade algebra, right? Okay, all right, and then read where they've made assumptions that makes it totally not matter because they made the thing constant, but whatever, all right? So the, so all I want to say about fractional reserve free banking is that their fundamental error really is twofold. First, right, they confuse money demand with time preference. So, so their story is right, that if people want more money, right, they go to the banks, they take out more loans, or this is going to drive up interest rates. Right. Okay, just wanting more money does not necessarily mean I'm going to go out and take a loan. Right? I could do other things. I don't have to take out a loan to do this. I don't have to pull down my savings uh, in order to do this either. I don't have to sell off assets. I could just do things like work more. Uh, this is an option, right? So an increased demand for money, well, compared to what? It's not necessarily compared to future goods relative to present goods. And so there's that fundamental confusion. A second problem is that it, it treats money demand as purely exogenous. It's something that just happens to change and does not respond at all, right, to things that banks might have control over, right? So for example, it might be that banks can convince people to hold more money by lowering interest rates, right? Possibly, okay. Well, Lower interest rates, sure. I might want to hold more money then, right? Under that, under those cases, like hold actual money, right? Rather than going out and buying bonds, for example, if interest rates are lower, right? I might be more inclined, right, to to do that type of thing. So if that's true, if it's true that people will respond to interest rates, right? Then money demand is not purely exogenous. That means the banks are not just passive, right? That they could potentially induce demand for their own product by decreasing. Uh, by decreasing the interest rate and thereby right, push out more money into the economy, the money, did not, the money was not originally demanded right, by that economy. They created this demand for it and we therefore end up with the business cycle again. At the same time, I don't wanna to be too hard on the free banking folks. Right? Uh, they like getting rid of the central bank. Sounds good. Right? We know under that system how much you're going to try to push out additional money that isn't backed by reserves is going to be limited. Right, so I do think it would be a significant improvement right, over the system we have. Also, if we can tie to this, as they often do, eliminating the various subsidies, there are these bailouts and the like that go into the banking system. That also would be a great improvement in getting banks to avoid risk. Uh, Mises actually calls this type of system kind of a second best right, scenario. Right. Uh, so then, in the banking system, the, what, what I would tend to advocate along, I think with many people here, is a 100% reserve system. Right, so I take money to the bank, they put it in the vault, I come back to the bank to get the money out, they take it out of the vault, it's, it's that simple. Right, so the way deposit banking would work is exactly the way I think many people have some sense that it works. Right, if they've not thought much about how banks make money and can manage to pay them interest on savings accounts, right, yeah, I put my money in the bank, they put it in the vault, and we take it back out. At the very least, this is how Jimmy Stewart thought that his depositors thought things worked. Right? From, it's a wonderful life, come on. It's, it's the most important scene, right? It's the bank run. That's true in every movie. 
with a bank run scene in it. So Mary Poppins and It's a Wonderful Life. Most important scene is the bank run. Okay. <laughs> All right, he says, you have the wrong idea about this place. Like, we have the money back in the safe, but we don't, right? We, we lent it out to so-and-so to build their house, so-and-so to build their house, right? Under 100% reserve banking system, it is actually in the safe, right? Everybody could come to the bank and take all the money out at once, no problems, right? Now, there are several people who have advocated this system. I first want to point out the non-Austrian advocates, right? There are people like Milton Friedman actually suggested that a 100% reserve system would be a useful thing to have. Now, he was mostly worried about how fractional reserve banks mess with the money supply. I say he had a different motive right, for this, but nonetheless advocated the system. Uh, John Cochran, uh, who is from the University of Chicago, if I recall correctly, has also spoken favorably, favorably of this. Lawrence Kotlikoff as well. Even right, our favorite economist that writes columns for the New York Times, right, Paul Krugman, has gone so far as to say a 100% reserve banking system is worth talking about. <laughs> I don't ask for much. <laughs> so, so, so we have the idea this might possibly be something that would work. Now we have straight up advocates as well amongst the um, Austrians. Naturally, uh, Mises, Rothbard, and uh, Huerta de Soto would fall under this. Uh, Mises kind of takes a slightly different approach to this uh, in suggesting we need 100% reserves for all future deposits. Right? Uh, I think Mises was very aware of kind of this idea of transition potentially being difficult. Right? So, Let's let things be the way they are now, but in the future, any money that we deposit has to be held in 100% reserves. Um, I have actually suggested, it is a, a paper that I wrote that not that long ago, just 10 years, <laughs> entitled 100% Reserves Now, it, was, it came out as a Mises Daily. I'm sure you remember it as, you know, as your eight or 10 year old self was looking at Mises.org, <laughs> right, where I observed that after quantitative easing, they made Mises' plan really easy because the banking system actually had enough money in reserve that it was just holding on to, to back every single dollar uh, in our, specifically our checking accounts, right? So, so every single dollar of M1 is actually backed 100% reserve uh, after quantitative easing at that point in December 2008, right? So I looked it up, right? And right now, there are about $2 trillion sitting in reserves in the banking system. If you add up, right, all of the demand deposits, other checkable deposits, they're about $2 trillion. So it was true 10 years ago, we could do 100% reserves immediately without necessarily creating any problems at all right, for the system as a whole. And it's still true now, right? Banks are still holding the level of reserves that we could just declare, yeah, go ahead and hold those, right? 100% reserves for anything that would be counted M1, right? That's what you need to do. And we wouldn't have banks having to scramble to find reserves. They already have them there, right? Which is kind of amazing. But even if they did have to scramble, I would point out that if we just take this banking approach alone, right, under a fiat currency, right, we can create reserves at whim. Right? Right, so even if banks were looking at 10% being held in reserves, the Fed could say, oh, we're going to just multiply our reserves by 10, and by the way, you have to hold them now. Right? It wouldn't have to create any change in their behavior at all, except it restricts them going forward and their ability to extend credit. And so very easily, right, we could eliminate the ability for credit expansion to happen and thereby right, ameliorate the business cycle. So I want to finish then with a kind of long quote uh, from Hans Senholtz uh, from his Money and Freedom. Right, so I, I hope right, that I've convinced you that sound money and free banking are, are not impossible. They're merely illegal. Right? This is why money must be deregulated. All financial institutions must be free again to issue their notes based on ordinary contract. Right? Use whatever money you want. In a free society, individuals are free to establish note issuing banks and create private clearinghouses. In freedom, the money and banking industry can create sound and honest currencies, just as other free industries can provide efficient and reliable products. Freedom of money and freedom of banking, these are the principles that must guide our steps. Thank you.